Top 10 Best F1 Races of the 1990s 1992 Monaco Grand Prix Okay Ask an F1 fan who knows their stuff to name a legendary battle from the history of our sport, and there's a high chance they'll reply with a certain fight for the lead of the 1992 Monaco Grand Prix. Which fight? Well, you'll have to wait and see, but if you're watching this video then you probably already know. To set the scene, Nigel Mansell had over double the points of any other driver coming into this race off the back of five victories in a row, and Williams had over triple the points of any other car. It was no surprise then to see the two blue rockets on the front row of the grid, with Mansell taking pole by almost nine tenths of a second. Best of the rest was Ayrton Senna in third, but the standout performer in qualifying had been Roberto Moreno, who had narrowly managed to qualify the famous Andrea Muda Judd for the first and only time. He'd knocked out both Brabham's in qualifying to achieve this, including future champion Damon Hill. But that's enough scene setting, because here come the lights. When the race started, Mansell put the power down and covered off the lead, and it looked like Patrese was going to do the same in second, but Senna dived up the inside and got through. A round of applause for that move. Alessi was fourth with Schumacher up to fifth. Later on in the lap, Pierluigi Martini became the first addition to the crunch count because that's just what Monaco does. Other early retirements were Carl Wendiger and Gianni Morbidelli, the latter of whom was absent on the starting grid, although did complete a lap before dropping out with gearbox troubles. Since Paul Belmondo had failed to qualify, as usual, Venliger's exit meant that both marches were out of the race already, forcing the team to march home for an early bath. As Mansell began to streak away, the battles were on behind him. Schumacher was looking this way and that on the rear of the Lacey, and Senna seemed to be practicing for something as he held back Patrese. Okay, look, we all know that this race ends with a climactic battle between Senna and Mansell, but I want to set the scene here. I've heard people say that it was easy for Senna because you can't overtake at Monaco, but I think they forget just how dominant the Williams was in early 1992. Look how Mansell has already disappeared into the distance, leading by almost 4 seconds at the end of lap 3, and imagine that car coming up behind you like an express train while you're heading for the flag at Monaco. It's important to understand just how good Mantle is here in order to understand what happens later on. Oh no! There's our second crash and it's Stefano Modena! How are they going to get that car out of the way I wonder? Yoink! The 90s were, of course, an era of poor car reliability, and within 10 laps of this race having started, both Tyrrells of Olivier Griard and Andrea de Cesaris were out, along with the Fon Metal of Gabriele Tarquini. This put both Von Matals out as well, as Andrea Chiesa had failed to qualify. As all of those drivers know, Monaco breeds desperation, and the inexperienced Michael Schumacher got all sorts of desperate in his fight with Jean Alesi, ramming him at the hairpin in a move reminiscent of Parnas on Irvine four years later. If you want to watch some highlights of that race, by the way, you can find them on my Daily Motion channel, which is where I upload all of the episodes which have been blocked by the pesky FOM bots. I'll put a link to that channel in the description of this video, providing that one isn't also blocked. Speaking of blocking... Unfortunately, this broadcast failed to show or mention at any point the Andrea Muda car of Roberto Moreno. He retired with an engine failure, and the entire racing career of the Andrea Muda team lasted just 11 laps. To be completely honest though, considering how team boss Andrea Sissetti acted and how the team treated their second driver Perry McCarthy, I can't say I have much sympathy for them. Anoraks like my friend Chris Whitfield may drool over the S921, but the team behind it was chaotic and negligent and were ultimately thrown out of the championship mid-season. Oh, and speaking of chaotic, it looks like Johnny Herbert crashed his Lotus! The marshals cleared the car away quickly, and who can blame them with how fast these cars come through? It's crazy to me that in those days they thought it was totally acceptable to have cars roaring past a crashed car on a narrow street, with only the bodies of marshals in the way. Oh, but they're covering the scene with a yellow flag to slow the cars down. Does it look like they're slowing down to you? They're racing, gosh. Thank goodness we now use the safety car. And Mantle has always been a charger. There's never been anybody that charged more than Nigel Mantle. Except, of course, for American hospitals, am I right? We're up to lap 20 already, and look closely at Martin Brundle's front wing here as he hops across the chicane. It's hanging off! Surprisingly, the broadcast never showed Martin pitting, but I presume he must have done, because he carried on with the race. 
Now, here's a confusing situation. Wedge as a marshal waves a blue flag at Alacy, who's on the same lap as Schumacher behind, and Alacy just lets him past. I'm honestly struggling to imagine why. Maybe he thought Mansell was coming through to put him a lap down already? Maybe he felt like a problem was developing with the car? Or maybe he was just scared that Schumacher was going to hit him again? Back in those days, it was more common to wave a blue flag at cars on the same lap, as technically the flag just means that there's a faster car trying to overtake you, but even so, it was rare to see someone just give up a place like that. Also, if you look back at it, he's actually making the overtake before the blue flag comes out, so I honestly have no idea what happened. <laughs> Now, if you're going to have a spin at Monaco, the entrance to Portier is probably the place to do it because it's one of the only places where you're going slow enough not to instantly hit a wall. There goes Aguri Suzuki, testing out my theory and continuing on well down the order. Oh, also, there goes a young Mika Hakkinen, running ninth. Cool. And uh, now he's out. Not so cool. Also out by this stage was Mauricio Gugelman in the Jordan. On lap 29, out went John Alacy in his Ferrari. The failure was apparently gearbox related, so I personally don't think it was related to the Schumacher collision, but I suppose we'll never know for sure. He would come back to finish on the podium in Monaco a year later, but sadly for 1992 he was out. Then again, at least there was less damage than at this year's Monaco Historic, right? Four laps later, out of the race went Gerhard Berger, elevating Ivan Capelli into fifth. Goodness, they're dropping like flies! Just under halfway through the race, only 13 of the 26 who started were still running. Look who's up to 6th now too, Michele Alboreto, the footwork driver who had finished in the points in the last three races. Considering that footwork hadn't scored a single point in 1991, this was quite something. Let's see if he kept it up. Back to the front of the field, we're riding with Schumacher now as he catches Patrese in the battle for third. These two would be teammates in 1993, but in 1992 they were rivals, as shown by how close they're getting here. At any other circuit, Schumacher probably would have passed Patrese by now, although here at Monaco it's less about how fast you can go, and more about how smooth you can be as you hold the guy behind you up and hope he doesn't ram you. By this point Ayrton Senna had pretty much disappeared up ahead, and Mansell was further ahead still, so this was the battle the cameras were all trained on, even if they weren't exactly going wheel to wheel. If I can ramble for a bit, I quite like how difficult it is to pass at Monaco. It builds tension, and encourages patience and strategy. I wish modern F1 fans would stop calling for it to be removed, and enjoy it for what it is, or at least put up with it for one weekend a year. Anyway, ramble over. And here is the battle for third position, closing up on... And Schumacher pushing hard, still riding behind Riccardo Patrese. Fifteen years between them, 23-year-old Michael Schumacher, 38-year-old Riccardo Patrese. Okay, I've got to admit, this race got rather stale. Pretty much nothing changed from lap 35 all the way through to lap 55 or so. Schumacher just followed Patrese, the commentators started talking about whatever they could think of, and that was pretty much it. It really is funny how roast into glasses frame races like this, isn't it? Finally something else happened in this race, and just look how lucky Michele Alboreto was to keep his footwork out of the wall here, my goodness! He'd just been passed by Martin Brundle for 6th position, which back then was the last points paying position, and obviously just got distracted by the pass and lost control. Props to Martin for getting back into the points actually, he was 15th after his pit stop. Whoopsie daisy, how is this for a unique view of Monaco? Ivan Capelli lost control of his Ferrari and climbed up the barriers. His car actually wasn't badly damaged, but it was enough to put him out of the race, allowing Bertrand Gascho into the points. Sadly, this bizarre crash is what a lot of people remember from Capelli's F1 career, which is unfair for the underrated Italian, who was given the Red Bull treatment by Ferrari, if you know what I mean. He will be replaced by Nicola Larini by the end of the year. And now it's time for some good old fashioned commentator's curse. Meantime, Nigel Mansell is on lap 69 out of 78 on his way to his sixth consecutive Grand Prix victory. 
Yes, and uh, only mechanical drama could rob Mansell now, and certainly he will have been looking after the car for really carefully for nearly the whole of this race. <laughs> Yes, amazingly, Mantle had developed a loose wheel nut, which at the time was suspected to be a puncture, and it pitted and lost his huge lead. He came out second behind Senna with just a handful of laps remaining. With fresh tyres and a super quick Williams, the race was on. Here in Comas, lap 73. After this, we've got lap 74, 5, 6, 7 and 8. Uh, yeah, Murray, you don't say. Anyway, look at that gap. Five seconds with five laps to go, and Mansell is decimating it. Now, here's the battle you've all been waiting for. With three laps to go, Mansell is all over the back of Senna for the win. To be honest, guys, I can't do a battle like this justice in this format, because it goes on for a whole three laps, and I only tend to do short clips and jokes, so if you want to see this fight in all of its majesty, please do look it up on YouTube. At least then you get the absolute joy of hearing Murray Walker's fantastic, energetic commentary as well. Murray actually claimed in an episode of F1 Rewind that this was one of his 10 favourite Grand Prix of all time, specifically because of this battle. Hearing how he talks about it, you can hear his passion. Lap 76, they're going to be starting the last lap for one at the end of this one. What a battle for the lead. This is Mansell's opportunity as they come up to Stan de Vos. He's tucked right under the rear wing of Ayrton Senna's McLaren. This is the start of lap 77, the last lap for one. This is going to be probably the closest finish we've ever had at Monaco. Right with him, right with him. Senna blocking away and sliding a lot. Senna knocking it down. And... This last lap coming up, of course, is going to be the crucial one. There's no way the mantle could get through and it won't be at the rest cat. It could be at Sandavot again. It's got to be a brilliantly courageous move by Nigel Mansell if he's going to win the Monaco Grand Prix for the first time. The left here, the right, the right again, the left and into the rest cat. But I do not see how Mansell, even Nigel Mansell on fresh cars, is going to be able to get by. Mansell closes but it's too late and Ayrton Senna wins at Monaco for the fifth time. I have no words to add to that, just scintillating. I gave the Grand Prix an 8.7 out of 10, because even though the usual four teams were running up front, the championship implications were basically nil, and there was almost no overtaking whatsoever, I gave this race an unprecedented plus five bonus points to reflect how a race doesn't necessarily need overtaking to be fun. If I had to say one word to justify each bonus point, they would be Senna, Mansell, Murray, Monaco, and History. I'll give the Driver of the Day award for Best Driver to Bertrand Gascho, who managed to finish 6th and score Venturi's only ever point in Formula 1, despite the fact his teammate Katayama had failed to even pre-qualify for this very same event. This was also Gascho's own last point in Formula 1, as after this he spent a year away from the sport before returning for two fruitless years at Pacific. Also, here's something interesting I found. After qualifying, Patrese and Gascho actually got into an altercation, because the former felt that the latter had held him up. Good job Bertrand didn't have a can of CS gas on him, eh hey, Ricardo? I'll give the Anui trophy for worst driver to Pierluigi Martini for crashing out on the very first lap. Drive safely guys and I'll see you next time.